Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Pauline Pastorate online Bible study on the book of 1 Timothy. The focus of our study this evening would be 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 3. Although the larger pericope of our passage would include up to verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 to 6. And we aim to answer the question, what makes a good minister? A good minister of Jesus Christ. As we start our study this evening, let me turn your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and let me read to you verses 1 up to verse 6 of this passage. The Word of God says, Now the Spirit exp uh, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypo hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with, an, with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Before we look into the Word of God this evening, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that there is indeed an existing guide to show us what to look for and how to be good ministers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, Father, we pray that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would enlighten the eyes of our understanding Help us to see the things you want us to see and the truths that we receive from your word this evening. Let it simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. The title of our, uh, of our study this evening is The Good Minister. And this is part number one. Now, <clears throat> we came across a job opening for pastors in the internet. Let me share it to you. Now this shows us that there is an obvious demand and search for good ministers to pastor the church. A good question to ask is, what exactly makes a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now if you'd look at those uh, preferred qualifications, we would see that some characteristics that are mentioned there are actually pastoral qualifications, which we talked about and discussed in detail in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 7 in our previous studies. But what really makes a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now let me share, you to, share to you tonight a direct declaration of what makes a good minister. And if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 6, we would see it said straightforwardly of how one is indeed a good minister of Jesus Christ. Now, we would see the simple condition. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Now, that would show us that this is the condition. And we see the result as, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Now that directly answers our question, right? Now it directly answers our question. So we ask the question now, what are these things that a good minister ought to put the brethren in remembrance? Now for the next weeks, we're going to look at the minister's warnings, teachings, and nourishing. And I hope you will join us in our series 
but we'll start our uh, series of studies with the minister's warning. Now we go back to our passage and we start our reading from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, where we read, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Now we would see that we have a conjunctive adverb that starts our pericope. Now this shows us that this is actually a separate pericope from the previous that we have talked about with what Paul plans to do in his visit with Timothy. Now he gives a separate set of instruction and revelation. The main clause of our passage would be, The Spirit speaketh expressly. Now the word expressly simply means in direct terms and plainly. This tells us that the Spirit did not waver around or beat around the bush. The Spirit directly stated and in plain terms, what's going to happen in the latter times now we would see we would see also the content of what the spirit speaketh expressly and that is seen by the conjunction that that signals a content clause for the word speaketh and the main clause of that content clause is as we read in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Now, that phrase, in the latter times, only occurs in this passage. But the word latter actually has the concept or meaning, that are the concept and meaning of what follows. Therefore, what Paul is simply saying is that in the times that follow his, that would be the latter times, this is what will happen. Some shall depart from the faith. Now we see, therefore, the good ministers of Jesus Christ, because of the decaying and corrupted nature of the world that steadily intensifies, there is a need for good ministers to declare their warning because indeed after Paul's time some shall depart from the faith truth is the apostle Paul is not surprised as a matter of fact he already told the Ephesian elders in Ephesia in Acts chapter 20 verse 29 to 30 as part of his uh, as part of his farewell address to them Paul says for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. And what will these grievous wolves do? Not sparing the flock. And where will these grievous wolves also come? Paul says, Also of your own selves shall men arise. So, after Paul's departing, there will be grievous wolves coming in and grievous wolves arising from within the church itself. And what will they do? They will speak, speak perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So what did Paul warn about? If after his departing, Grievous wolves will enter. What did Paul instruct? We read in verse number 31 of Acts chapter 20. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul knows that there will always be threats, oppositions, corruptors, grievous wolves that will enter, especially after his departing. 
But we would see that as a good minister warns, Paul also warns the church of the departing from the faith that is to come in the latter times. Now, how can the church be on guard? And what should ministers of Jesus Christ be warning their people about? Now, we would go back to our passage and see what caused these departings from the faith. Paul says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And we would see the first way how some shall depart from the faith. And we would read these words, giving heed, and there's an object. The first one is, to seducing spirits. Some shall fall away from the faith because they give heed to seducing spirits. The Apostle Paul warned of the seducers in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 13, where he tells Timothy also, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. From the time of Paul, and so much worse today, evil men and seducers waxed and continue to wax worse and worse. From the time of the Apostle Paul up until now, there are evil men and seducers who will deceive because they are also deceived. Now, these seducers are seen in context as people as we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. And this is very important to notice. These seducers and evil men having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Now, this is a very important warning because evil men and seducers may have a form of godliness, but they in truth deny the power thereof. The truth is, my friends, Many Christians today and many believers judge a book by their cover. When you see people that look like this, we can immediately judge them and say, Oh, they're villains. Oh, these are the evil men and the seducers that Paul is talking about. But remember what Paul said. The evil men and seducers have the form of of godliness that means that evil men and seducers can look like that remember paul writes in second corinthians chapter 11 verse number 40 and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light if satan can manifest himself as an angel of light Cannot the evil men and seducers have the form of godliness, but ultimately they deny the power thereof? How does a church know a seducing spirit? We could read that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, where Paul says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan transforms as an angel of light. His ministers also appear as ministers of righteousness, but their end shall be according to their works. Why? What exactly are their works? We could read that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, uh, verse 6 to 8, that says, For of, of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins. You would know the seducers and the evil men by their works. Yes, they have the form of godliness, yet their immoralities expose them for who they really are. And sometimes he would say, isn't things like this 
prevalent in churches today? How many mega churches, popular churches, large and big churches today are entangled with many cases of sexual abuse among its people? That's a dangerous path. Because these people have the form of godliness, yet they deny the power thereof, and by their works, they lead captive silly women laden with sins. And they are led away with diverse lusts. They are known by their immoralities. They are known by their appetites. And look at this. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. These evil men and seducers, they are known for their immoralities, they are known for their appetites, and they are known to resist the truth. And they are men of corrupt minds. And here's the clincher. Reprobate concerning the faith. Evil men and seducers would be immoral, would be given to diverse lusts, they would be resisting the truth with nail and claw, with tooth and nail. They are men of corrupt minds. They are not weak-minded people, but they use their wisdom in a corrupted way. And they are reprobate concerning the truth regarding the faith. And ultimately, my friends, they can fail to answer the basic question, whose faith justifies? Whose faith justifies? Scripture show beyond reasonable doubt, as it is written in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul makes it very clear, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, and pay attention, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Whose faith justifies? Paul says clearly, the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, shall no flesh be justified. That verse in and of itself shows us clearly and beyond reasonable doubt that our justification is not by us nor by our own faith, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. But what do seducing spirits do? Men of corrupt minds would resist this truth and show themselves reprobate concerning the faith. And they would use the modern Bibles, which if you'd notice in our screens today, here are the modern and popular versions of the English Bible. Now we would see that the faith of Christ is denied and replaced with faith in Jesus Christ. Whose faith justifies? The NIV says, our faith in Christ. So does the New Living Translation. So does the English Standard Version. So does the New King James. So does the New American Standard Bible in its recent publication in 2020. The New Legacy Standard Bible says, it's the faith in Christ that justifies us. It's our faith not the faith of Christ. The Christian Standard Bible says the same. So does the American Standard Version, the Contemporary English Version, the Douai Rames, the English Revised Version, the God's World Word Translation, the Good News Translation, and the World English Bible. All of these Bibles deny that our justification is by the faith of Jesus Christ. But these are scholars. 
These are intelligent men. They are translators and respected. Yet what do they do? With corrupted minds, they deny the faith of Christ. And maybe you're, you're taught with these things. And you would say, but what does the Greek say? So we ask, what does the Greek say? Now in your screens are shown the two major sources of Greek family texts. We have the Textus Receptus lines represented by the Scrivener and the Stephanus. And if you look at the uh, squiggly red box or circles there, you would see the phrase pistos yeso Christo. And that is a genitive and it's translated simply faith of Jesus Christ. And there's no textual discrepancy regarding those phrases because the Scrivener, the Stephanus, the Byzantine, as well as the UBS Nestle and Nestle Allen text contain the same phrasing. The faith of Jesus Christ is in the Greek. Now for you who don't know the Greek, we posted also an interlinear. And you would see the, translator, the translation there. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. It's the faith of Christ. How can this be beyond reasonable doubt? How can this be nothing less than staring us in the faith, face and still men of corrupted minds would deny the faith of Christ? And just in case any would question the rendition of the genitive case as of, well, let me show you a Greek grammar of an elementary level. The genitive case is a description, identification, and an attribution. The characteristic translation word is of. You see? So when you translate the genitive, it's of. And some would say, this might be an issue between an objective genitive and a subjective genitive. But my question is, even if it's a case of an objective genitive, it's still translated as of. But what's wrong and what is happening? It's simply the denial of the faith of Christ. Now some would say and relegate and say, oh, the word can be translated as Faithfulness, as there are some instances where the word faith is rendered as faithfulness. Although, that is simply a remote meaning of the Greek word pistis. And if you would see the usage of the word pistis when it's used in Galatians 2.16, and the occurrences of the phrase faith of Jesus Christ and even the faith of God, it's talking about not as a descriptive, but rather as a noun, rather as a noun that is being modified. Therefore, it cannot be rendered as a descriptive and say it's faithfulness. Because if you look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, our justification in the negative statement is not by the workfulness of the law. That doesn't make sense, right? Then it wouldn't make sense that you would translate the pistis there as the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Bottom line, my friends, this is simply the denial of the faith of Christ, of those who are reprobate in the faith, men of corrupted minds who would rather stare the truth and say, I resist the truth. And that is, my friends, a terrible thing. Why? Why is the faith of Christ important? Because we know that if our justification is by the faith of Christ, then it also shows us, as scriptures tell us, that our justification is by the finished work of Jesus Christ. This is what and where many people stumble. When you say we are justified by our faith, then we are also told that faith without works is dead. And that is true. Faith without works is dead. 
So how can we be saved by grace if we are justified by faith and works are needed to verify that faith? That we are not saved by grace. Because if there are any works with grace, it ceases to be grace. And we are not saved by grace, by faith alone, because faith necessitates works. But if it's the faith of Christ that justified us, as scriptures clearly say, then it is also the finished work of Jesus Christ that justifies us, as we would read in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, that says, Jesus Christ who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That death and resurrection of Jesus Christ comprised his finished work and the content also of the gospel of our salvation, which we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, that says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. My friends, in the end, seducing spirits beguile men away from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Apostle Paul warns of that as well in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 9, where Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Right there you would see the importance of Paul's gospel. If anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed, Paul says. And we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Beware of seducing spirits that would seduce us away from the gospel preaching another gospel like an angel in heaven. Listen to the gospel that is being preached. Listen to the truth of scriptures that they uphold. Are they using a plain reading? Or are they simply presenting to you the wisdom of words? My friends, beware of giving heed to seducing spirits. Beware also, and back in our text, of doctrines of devils. Now, what exactly is a doctrine of a devil? A doctrine is basically defined as whatever is taught. So, a doctrine is simply a teaching. A devil is defined as, in Christian theology, an evil spirit or being a fallen angel. Now, this may speak about Satan himself, but it's also used to refer to a very wicked person in ludicrous language and great evil. In profane language, it is an expletive expressing wonder, vexation, and the sort. Also, it may refer to an idol or a false god. Now, we put that those definitions together and we see that the doctrine of devils would be a teaching that comes from Satan evil men, idols, or false gods. An example of this would be in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 to 4, where Paul writes, saying, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, subtlety, now you would see 
that this is the work of the devil. It is to beguile through subtlety. So what's the work of the devil? So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The doctrine of devils corrupt a person away from the simplicity that is in Christ as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And not only that, we would see, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, because remember, Paul says, remember my gospel, remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. The Jesus Christ that Paul preached is the Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again for our sins and for our justification. But if anyone comes and preach another Jesus whom Paul and company had not preached, that is a telltale sign of a corrupting influence, a beguiling doctrine of the devil. Or, Paul says, if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received. How exactly does one in this dispensation of grace receive the spirit? Is it laid hands on? Is it imputed on us by a pastor? Is it through an inanimate object like a stone or a rock or something like that so that your energies would be attuned to feel the spirit of God? Is it through music and, and singing or, or the sort? No. What says scriptures? In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14, we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The moment we trust in Christ, after we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, any spirit that is given, not by the way that Paul showed, is receiving another spirit. And here's the worst. Or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might, as, ye might well bear with him. The beguiling and corrupting influence away from the simplicity that is in Christ by doctrines of devils preaches another Jesus gives you another spirit and proclaims another gospel oh we have to beware we have to beware and if we want to be clear what was the gospel that the Corinthians accepted is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 which also ye have received. They have already received Paul's gospel. It declares to them the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. If another gospel is presented, which is not the gospel they received, then that is another gospel. Giving way to another spirit. Presenting another Jesus. Beware of the doctrine of of devils. We go back to our passage and we see another way or another cause of how some depart from the faith. We read in verse number two, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Those who have departed from the faith, seduced by spirits and doctrines of devils, are now speaking lies in hypocrisy what exactly is a lying speaking lies in hypocrisy paul says in romans chapter 16 verse 17 to 18 he says now i beseech you brethren mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned we see there that to know those who are speaking lies in hypocrisy. You have a doctrine that you have learned. 
We have a doctrine that we have learned. And that doctrine is the doctrine that Paul gave. So, if others are causing divisions and offenses because they're contrary to the doctrine that Paul preached, and that's not the doctrine of denominations, this supposed to be is the doctrine of Paul. Those people ought to be marked, and Paul says, and avoid them. Why? For they... For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. But what? But their own belly. And here's what they do. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. The standard doctrine is Paul's. And remember that Paul says that he came not with excellency of speech. But this would come with good words. They would, this would come with fair speeches. And they would deceive the hearts of the simple. That's their M.O. They speak lies in hypocrisy. Here's an interesting word. for the. Uh, here's an interesting parallel for the word hypocrisy. The word is derived from the word, that the Greek word, that now means actor, a hypocrites. You see? Their lies are spoken with good words. Their lies are spoken with fair speeches. Yet it masks the truth, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Not only that, we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 14, where Paul says, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because there's no, not supposed to be many doctrines, but in this dispensation of grace, we must uphold our apostles' doctrine. But these people, speaking lies and hypocrisy, they will carry out people like children with every wind of of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Good ministers wonder people of these lying hypocritical teachers waiting to deceive by their good words and fair speeches. And my friends, it's easy to be swayed by eloquence. But may your faith and your wisdom and your heart stand in the truth of the Scripture beyond the words of men. Beware of good words and fair speeches. Let's go back to our passage and we would see another way in which some depart from the faith having their consciences seared with a hot iron. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. At this point of time, maybe you're wondering, how can people like this have the stomach or the gut or the good sense to keep up with their terrible, terrible deception. In Tagalog, we may be tempted to call these people as halang ang bituka. But that gives us the answer. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. A harsh reality, my friends, is that those who are in a lie would never really consciously know that they are in a lie. They're blind. And much worse, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. 
They have come to the point that they are past feeling. So much so when truth comes before them, their only response is to take offense. To bear their fangs and say, oh, it's a fighting stance, you know. Their past feeling. But this is what Paul says about them. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance, ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. Can you see those words? Vanity of the mind, the understanding darkened, ignorance that is in them and the blindness of their heart. Because of these things, Paul says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Past feeling. Lasciviousness uncleanness with greediness. When the conscience is seared, immoral acts become the norm. Lying becomes the norm. Rejection of the truth becomes the norm. Corruption becomes the norm. Hypocrisy becomes the the norm. Maybe you're feeling that this is all too prevalent in churches today. But Paul says this is characteristic that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They give heed to seducing spirits, doctrine of devils. They speak lies in hypocrisy. They have their conscience seared with a hot iron. But there's also more. We read on in verse number 3. Forbidding to marry. And that is what they do. They even control relations to let people to forbid marriage. Now Paul's doctrine about getting married can be seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 2, where Paul says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Now that is Paul's doctrine. Let every man have his own wife, let every woman have her own husband. But we would also see that Paul speaks, but there's a this, there's a qualification there. Paul speaks also, continuing in verse number 6 to 8 of 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Now that is a disclaimer right there. What's a disclaimer? Paul says, For I would, now remember because this is permission, not a commandment, Paul says, I would, that is a subjunctive. That's just a will or a wish that he wants. I would that all men were even as myself. Now what exactly is that? Now, we will see that later on. But Paul says, But every man hath his proper gift of God. Which means to say, Not everyone can be as he is. As not anyone, everyone can get married. I've heard a wise saying in one of my ministries that he says that between marriage and death, marriage is uncertain. But death is. So it's more secure, it's more likely for a person to die than for a person to actually get married. Such wise words for a young person. But every man... Paul says, had his proper gift of God. There are those whom God gives to be married. 
And there are those whom God gives not to get married. Paul says, one after this manner and another after that. Now Paul says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, what? It is good for them if they abide even as I. So what is Paul? He is either an unmarried person or a widow. But the same concept. He has no wife at the present time. But there's a disclaimer. And Paul again says in verse 25 to 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, Now concerning virgins or the unmarried, I have no commandment of the Lord. Notice the disclaimer. I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment. As he said before, this is not a command but permission. Now this is not a commandment yet a judgment. What's the judgment? As one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful, I suppose, therefore, that it is good for the present distress, I say that it is good for a man so to be. Meaning to say, not to get married. So, in the light of these disclaimers, Paul is saying, here's the normal doctrine. Get married. But in case of what's convenient and what works with him, he would will that others be as he is but not as a commandment not of the lord but a judgment and a permission for this present distress i think this is where the problem lies because peter even warned of this when he said second peter chapter 3 verse 15 to 16 and account that the long suffering of our lord is salvation even as our beloved brother paul also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Now, this would show that Peter says that Paul had wrote according to the wisdom given to him. And he says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. This is where those who depart from the faith forbid to marry. But nevertheless, Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28, but, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she had not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Quite simple. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but had power over his own will, and had so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, do it well. So then, he that giveth her in marriage, do it well, but he that giveth her not in marriage, do it better. This is in no way forbidding to marry. But that's what people who are unlearned and unstable would rest with Paul's doctrine. And not only that, forbidding to marry, and go, going back to our passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, and commanding to abstain from meats, meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving. By whom? Of them which believe and know the truth. Meats, my friends, is actually another term for food in the scriptures. Meats are called, are created by God. And the intention for food is to be received 
with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. What truth? This. Romans chapter 14, verse 17, Paul writes, For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. In this dispensation of grace, meat and drink wouldn't add to our righteousness, to our peace, and our joy in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 8, Paul says, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat, we are the better, neither if we eat not, are we the worse. No. Meat has nothing to do with our spiritual status. Because remember, our salvation and preservation is premised not on the works that we do, but by the faith and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, this is probably one of the ways in which the unstable and unlearned rest and say, Oh, your faith justifies you, right? And you say, Yes, my faith justifies me. And he would say, But your faith must be proven by works. And the works that commend us to God are meats. So abstain from these kinds of meats. Abstain from the unclean foods. Be a vegan. Be a like this. Abstain from these foods. And you will be more spiritual. More in tune with the Spirit. Now that is pure nonsense. Because the truth is, it's not our faith that justifies us. It is the faith of Jesus Christ and it's the finished work of Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection that justifies us before God. And because of that, we are accepted in the Beloved by grace. It doesn't matter what we eat nor we drink. For meat commendeth us not to God. We're not better if we eat, so we're not worse if we do not eat. Paul also says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Commanding to abstain from meats is a characteristic of them that depart from the faith. Nevertheless, we are instructed by our Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 4, that says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not the him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. That no man judge us by what we eat or what we don't drink, what we, what we don't eat. Let no man despise us by what we allow or not allow. Because we are all going to stand before God, and it is God that holds us up. As a good minister, we see that the Apostle Paul warned Timothy, who ought to warn the church, that some would depart from the faith in the latter times. And Apostle Paul warned about giving heed to seducing, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, the speaking lies in hypocrisy, having conscience seared with a hot iron of those that forbid to marry and those who command to abstain from meats. 
Now, our text simply says that Paul exhorts Timothy on what it takes to be a good minister in warning and teaching his people. And the prayer that we have for you tonight is that a good minister warns as the Apostle Paul warned the church of the departing from the faith in the latter times. My friends, we live in those times that Paul calls latter times. And indeed, there are so many, many pictures today of those who give heed to seducing spirits, to doctrines of devils, of those who speak lies and hypocrisy, of those who have their consciences seared with a hot iron, and those who forbid to marry and abstain from meats, commanding to abstain from meats. But a good minister warns. And my prayer is that if you're listening right now, do warn your people that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. But our prayer for you is that you would consider the truth of the gospel first and foremost, the gospel that Paul preached that declares Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again. The gospel of our salvation that we hear and by which we trust in Christ, believing the sufficiency of His finished work. My fellow pastors, let us not be weary of warning and let us warn continually the church, the ministry that God has entrusted us. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can see that a good minister warns. It might not be something pretty to hear, but the warning is important, especially in these latter times where the Spirit speak it expressly that some shall depart from the faith. Father, help us to guard against giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Help us to watch out for those who speak lies and hypocrisy. Help us to mark and avoid those who have their conscience seared with a hot iron and that we would be able to tell what scripture says about forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, that perchance they would be exposed to the truth and God would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Father, we commit to you our study this evening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcasts. On Saturday, we have a broadcast of the Comfort Verses in Context. On Monday, we pray that we can do another broadcast of the Precepts from the Proverbs and hope to catch you again for another session of the Pauline Pastorate next week as we continue the series of What is a Good Minister? So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you. <music>